quick so you can uh, make the new Uncommons Greg series, okay? All right, so I'm a CTO and co-founder of a startup called Biotech. And uh, this is our story from the, how we did the first code line and we, did, uh, we got the first paying customer and a little bit more. So just a little bit about the products, you've got some impression what we're doing. So the Biotech is a, a software as a service, it's a web application which helps uh, business to business sales guys to manage the complex deals and uh, helps to more effectively communicate with the buyers and in essence as a marketing message we say you close more deals and close them faster. I'm not going to go into much detail because it's really niche product, it's for B2B sales guys but in essence what you do, you when you have a new deal, let's say LinkedIn wants to sell, sell a service to General Electric, you create a, a buyer portal, you put all the uh, relevant content like uh, some case studies, some marketing materials, you might put some proposals and so on. You invite all the stakeholders, you put some nice welcome message and you invite all these guys and hopefully they will view it, uh, check all the content, you see all the analytics what they are doing and after that you can uh, start collaborating, chatting, sending messages and, and that really speeds up the decision making process in the in buyer side. So the team, and that's really important. Uh, we are two co-founders at Biotech. I met uh, Gerald, he's there, hiding. <laughs> uh, we met, uh, he was a seller at Rockspace and I was a buyer back in for finance and we closed a pretty big deal and, and during that process we kind of realized this, this whole process kind of sucks, you can do, do something better. So we, at almost two years ago, we simply left our kind of safe jobs, but you know after this, all this crisis, you know there's no safe jobs, just, there are just jobs. And we started a company, and, um, and at the moment we are six guys here, and Andre Sarbiestos are all some senior engineers, they definitely code better than me. And we got two ones who is doing a great job at sales and uh, customer so support, he's still hiding there. And we got uh, Yurgis, a completely new guy who didn't know anything about coding, I would say, and in one year, he might be coding better than I do, maybe. Let's see. So, yeah, startups are good for you guys actually to learn a lot of things because you have to do everything, not just one small thing. So, what were my initial expectations when I started the startup? I didn't know anything. I thought it's a really sexy thing to do. Everybody's doing like Facebook. I watched Facebook movie, of course, and then Apple movie and everything. It's all that, that's cool. I have to do it. So, I thought, I'm going to start, I'm going to code, and you're going to sell it, and, and we are millionaires. That's it. That's, that's, that was the plan. That's the plan, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, in this presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit how it really happened. So, for that, what is a startup? And this, I saw this picture um, on Facebook like two days ago, and I think Jordan, correct me, this is a different quote, actually, that's not the guy, this is Steve Blank, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you should read books by Steve Blank. A uh, startup is a company who doesn't know what his product, it, product is, the startup doesn't know what the customer sees, like perfectly, and essentially, if you don't know both of these, you don't know how to make the money, so you work out and I'm going to find out what is your, I think, the most important, what is your customer. You know if your customer, you can understand what is his problems. Then you build a product for these problems and money will come. Yeah, don't start with the money, I guess. So what's, what's really happened at uh, Biotech? So we established company in uh, June 2013. It's a, it's a UK uh, company, but the, most of this thing is still uh, maybe forever in Latvia. And first six months was nothing. We built a product, like coding, coding, shipping, excited, few parties, and it's gonna make, it's gonna be huge, and, and nothing happens. Like, you look at uh, several logs, and they're like silent. And you got 10 entries, and ooh, the best day ever. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, but it, it wasn't depressing, because it's only six months, you know? <laughs> and then after six months, on the 1st of January, we, we said, okay, this is the first beta version. It, it's launched. We, we published everything on LinkedIn, on Facebook. This is the first version. But, well, this, these graphs are number of projects created, and it's not millions, right? So, <laughs> so uh, nothing, not much happened, really. A few guys were coming and then just left and never came back. So you phone them and they don't even pick up your phone. 
So yeah, so we keep kept going and, and we lost at this point I think half of the team, right? Yeah. They all quit. It was very, very depressing moment. So <coughs> if you're depressed at six months, just keep going because it's good I guess. And then uh, we got accepted to London uh, Seed Camp months, ago, months after this period. When they presented our startup, we met a met few investors and, and potential customers, but we didn't went through to the next level and we are again another failure for the startup, but still just keep going. So we kept coding for the next six months, going. And what you realized even before these six months that you have to really understand your customers. So my co-founder Gerald really following this uber cool book called Rofit Svartik Man Test. Definitely read this book. Um, he went through all these interviews and interviewed like 120 sales guys and he really understood what is what are this their pain, what should be focused on. Because initially we built something and we were trying to push those sales guys to use our solution. You should do vice versa, you understand their problem and build a solution for that. So in one year we started uh, I guess we simply ran out of finance, right? Uh, and we started to raise money and we got ups and downs every day and we got some nice offer and a nice from uh, some VC and they said okay we're gonna put into you really big chunk of money and you're gonna grow the company but looking at the graphs it's the company wasn't growing like exponentially just little bit little bit and, and we kind of understood that this this is too early so if you take too much money in the beginning you're gonna kill your company because VC will call you almost I guess every day and ask you why didn't you close this deal, why didn't you close that deal, because your product sucks, probably. You don't know what you're building, still. And finally, well not finally, right now, it's um, in uh, this year, maybe two months ago, we, ra we really deployed the product which we are kind of proud of. We see engagement going up, and this is this is December, right, this, this really sucks for me to be everybody's in a building Christmas trees and presents and so on. But, but after in January, everybody's coming back to the office and, and they saw the new new version of the product and they really loved it and, and they're starting to use it and we see like, not really exponential growth, but it's more like 20% per month, which becomes exponential once you really grow. Uh, and that's the number you need to really go for the investment. Because if you don't have a 15, 20 or more percent growth months to months. Don't even talk with VCs, they don't want to see you, most probably you're going to waste your time. So yeah, right now we are here and next month is going to be something quite bigger, so I hope next time not going to be enough space here to show our progress. So what we, did, uh, what we are doing to reach current uh, stage in our startup and, and, and we are just to Emphasize we are not really veterans of the startups. It's the first startup we are doing and there's still a lot of chances we're gonna fail So it's still just uh, like a beginning of the startup Basically we code ship Ship the software and then we learn and then we code And this process can take maybe five minutes sometimes and sometimes it takes uh, Three months depends on the feature and on, on the product you're building But this is really small part of the whole startup and Honestly, it's not the most exciting. <coughs> really important in a B2B space is the sales. If you don't have a good good sales, you can't sell a good product. If you get a good sales, maybe you can sell a shitty product. Maybe. Legals, that's the things I hate the most. I can't read. This is more arcane than reading the assembly code, definitely. Support, this is, this is fun. Yeah, you, you get to talk with your customers. Like last Sunday I spent one hour talking to a customer in Denmark and I was excited because that was like a company I'm building not I'm in support for some big other company and nobody cares. I spent one hour in uh, Sunday. Networking, that's I really suck at this but um, you have to meet people to get connections. Nobody can uh, just come to your website and sign up. <coughs> Accounting naturally, and then marketing, somebody has to has to know about it, you can do social and blogging but I guess you shouldn't blog before you don't have a good product and then uh, one of the final is the fundraising 
Fortunately, I'm not doing this, uh, Gerald is doing, but this can take eat all of your time and nerves. This is very, very stressful because you are taking somebody else's money. Imagine yourself giving money to somebody else. You're going to ask a lot of questions and you're going to be really, really detailed and, and I'm going to do a lot of due diligence um, of your company. But um, yeah, it, it, and actually it can take like, we expect it to take three months, it takes like six months, sometimes it takes even more. So be prepared. Once you start fundraising, hopefully there's some other guy in the startup who can do product development because everything else will stop. And like small pieces of vision, even if you do these short cycles of code, ship and learn, you have to think about where you're going to be after a year, two, and five years. Like you're going to take over the world, you're going to be next Facebook maybe or something. Because investors really like that. But in the next uh, slides, I'm going to talk about this uh, small kind of piece. So, coding. We have web application, we do coding, and, and we have a backend. And when we started, we said, okay, let's at least in the backend select the tools we, we know because this piece has to work. Otherwise, you screw up the data, and security sucks, and everything. Just, just take what you know. And we took Technology is what we knew from previous jobs. Actually, that was Java 7, but we migrated to Java 8 in a, was it, like three hours. Um, we picked Spring, Spring Root, very easy to, to start the containers, Gradle for build system, and a lot of other technologies. Um, but to keep things fun, we also selected some new technologies like Mongo, but after we presented <laughs> We are using Mongo in a tech hub, which is a startup community. We realized that Mongo is not sexy anymore because they have been using it for a few years already. Uh, then we also choose uh, Firebase, which is a real-time communication slash database solution we are using for chat, live pitch, uh, screen sharing, all these functionalities. One thing I really regret, we selected Ruby. We saw, yeah, let's, I mean, we are a startup, we have to write code very fast. But Ruby is that fast. I mean, <laughs> When the new employees come, they couldn't understand my Groovy code, so we just deleted it and then we're writing uh, old school Java and it, and it still works today. And architecture, there's no architecture, there's just REST and API endpoint that say get project, get all the projects for the user. It calls simple logic, uh, some repository, some transformations maybe, and it calls Mongo, and that's it. Sometimes we call some email services or really in a synchronous mode. Because once you have one request per day, you don't need in, uh, message queues and uh, all that uh, fancy architectures or Redis. We are ready to scale, but initially just don't spend time on these fancy architectures. No microservices, please. Okay, and then UI. UI, that's real itch. Uh, UI and UX is really hard. Even design is not that difficult, uh, or you can hire a designer. What you're going to tell to your designer? Build me a screen, or uh, what screen? He will be a nice screen, and the users want to understand it. So you really need to understand the UX, how the user is going to go through your system and do what you really want to do them. So sign up, create a project, share with the customer, customer opens the link, and views the content, and shares, and comments, and, and the sales, sales guy is really happy. Uh, this is still the, the, the challenge we are facing and, and, and trying to solve. So this, the whole web browser, JS, uh, JavaScript, CSS, that's a big mess. We didn't have any experience before, so we had to learn. And, and my first version of application is so bad, I, I wouldn't show it here. It's like it's deleted completely. So only after one and a half a year, and I feel like and my team feel confident that we know the GS and CSS and HTML and we can build something really fancy. So we pick a tools, Angular and Twitter Bootstrap, which brings you know, some kind of structure so you don't build this some crazy jQuery spaghetti code. We still use jQuery, of course, against Angular philosophy. But they have really help, really help. For a testing, sometimes we test our code. <laughs> and uh, the, the biggest live server have been automated API tests. That's when you run, uh, we, we have this Spock uh, tests group, that's Groovy, that, Groovy there is really great. 
run against or API tests which run against kind of real environment, against real Mongo, against real email servers, against real Salesforce and so on. We just make sure once we deploy it, it actually works. And unit tests, I, I think we maybe have 15 or 20 unit tests. It's, 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 because we don't have much logic in backend. If you want to write unit tests, you're going to write mocks and I hate tests which are 10 times longer than actual business logic. Like, <laughs> Because we don't have a manager to tell that we have 90% uh, code coverage, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter really. <laughs> so, uh, and at the end we realized that manual UI, UI testing still, for us, is a good, good thing. I did, again, big mistake, I wasted so much time. You build first screen, okay, I'm going to write my automated UI test because I want to make sure it's going to work for one user per day. Uh, and then after three months I change the screen, or even after months again, and then again, again, and just keep spending these hours on UI tests, and uh, after maybe third or fifth time I just deleted them. I'm a happy person. <laughs> you do UI tests once you, once you know what your product is. Okay? Don't waste your time there. Shipping, that's, I would say, one of the most important things. Uh, for us it's important to fast, and most importantly, zero downtime deplo deployments because you can do them in the middle of the day while, you're, while your users are using your product. In first six months, it doesn't matter this zero downtime because you don't have any users. Just deploy <laughs> ten times per day and a one hour downtime, it's, it's fine. But still, it has to be fast because if it's a manual, too much manual process, it's, ah, I'm not going to deploy this, I'm going to wait for next week and just aggregate some features and then you have lots of bugs and so on. And to accomplish this simple deployment, we try to use as a service as much as possible. We don't want to uh, keep our own email service, for example, because how do you know that your email service is on a blacklist? You don't know. So better use external services. And this is our kind of topology. It's not like maybe half of this what we have, but only this orange orange box is what we really manage. It's like Nginx uh, config file. 50 lines, application servers in our <coughs> deployment scripts, another maybe 200 lines, and then some firewall stuff, and that's it. The rest of the stuff is managed by our uh, partners, which is uh, Rackspace, which is like a nice, simple, customer-oriented uh, cloud provider, and Object Rocket, which does our MongoDB deployment, and honestly, don't deploy your own Mongo, just pay initially $5 per month and use some uh, uh, hosted the uh, Mongo uh, service. And yeah, one tool I would like to emphasize is Ansible that allows us to really quickly deploy without any manual work. So this one line <coughs> lets us to deploy a whole solution to the production. And uh, we spend like one weekend just going through uh, what if moments. But then it works and, and it's really cool. And this is our continuous integration server farm. It's called Andres and it's called VS2. So really they, there's some really advanced synchronization algorithms how you deploy versions to productions. But honestly, it's like if you have small teams that are sitting in the same room, just you don't need Jenkins and build pipelines. The guys really can talk. And that's it, all you need. Of course, few procedures to follow. So you have the same quality, but it's only me actually who deployed experimental version accidentally to production. You guys never failed. <laughs> so learn. Once you deploy, you have to learn what you deploy recently. And if possible, always listen to your customers. Either on the phone, email, or some customer service tool, or face-to-face, or, -face, or some party, that's the, the best, really. After three beers, they're going to tell all the truths that they will think about your product. But that's possible. Do it first, and initially, that's the only way, actually. Once you have some data, people are coming back to your product, so look at the data, because there's one thing what users tell, I love this product, and you got data, they locked in two months ago. Okay, so what? So what, we are using few tools uh, to learn from the data. Uh, one of them is Mixpanel, so it's like advanced Google Analytics, which helps us to monitor events based on user level, so you, you can see basically every user clicked what button, what they entered in the fields and so on. And you can build nice reports on top of that. I mean, the intercom to do customer support. So it's like real-time customer support. You can chat there and they can send some 
screenshots and files, so it really helps email kind of sucks in this case. Not just learning, also monitoring to see if everything is okay with your backends, like new relic or dynamics. You want to see the, any errors in your JavaScript code, so you use uh, Java, uh, JavaScript um, exception catching tools like Bugsnack. There are like plenty of these. And sometimes you really want to get fancy and use Inspect like to see like recorded sessions with all the mouse movements and when they click it. So you come back home, take a coffee, and just spend three hours watching these five users uh, working on your application. It helps them understand why they are not using the application most often. Okay. Help me. <laughs> I don't know, Mac. It was working with the keyboard. Just present and use the keyboard. Yeah, I just use this. Sorry, guys. So this is my next panel. We use this called Funnels. We have some initial event, and then we see how many users actually do something else. So once you deploy a new feature, you try to increase these two other numbers. A few examples from learning, like once we deployed really, we thought that's a that's super cool feature. We deployed a feature where you can talk with your buyers through browsers, through audio, web RTC. But after learning, we realized that in corporate environment, uh, sales guys have to use ordinary phones because their time is recorded and their kind of salaries depend how much time they spend on the phone. So no matter how much cool feature you build, they're not going to use it because there's some other policies in the companies. And sharing, like initially when we built a product, nobody was sharing the project with other buyers. And so we, we kept just adding, adding extra, extra pop-ups, like annoying pop-ups, but they work, and uh, yeah, works. And uh, at the end we got like two, three hundred percent increase in this uh, feature usage. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, a few tips, uh, this is really my personal experience. Don't take it as the ultimate truth. If, you, if I'm a technical guy, right? So if you want to build a startup, going at least for B2B, you need to have a non-technical co-founder like uh, I had the general, with a hustler who can actually speak with the people. And be ready that the journey is going to be long, long, and it's going to fail a lot of times. But don't be afraid of your failures. Full time, yeah. Like, if you're gonna do your startup like one, two hours of, after your main job, you have two failures. You're gonna fail your main job, you're gonna fail your startup. So if you believe in your idea, just go full time to your startup. You're gonna get next job anyway, if you wish. And yeah, aim for big markets. I think we're kind of lucky because we're in a sales world, because if you build something really useful for sales, companies are crazy on spending money there, already spending. But if you want to build, let's say, I'm going to build a startup and I'm going to build a new programming language. It's really exciting. It's like technically, that's I couldn't do this. But in history, there's nobody who became rich by building a new programming language. Even Java didn't commercialize. Some was bought by Oracle. So think about it. Another tip is, uh, yeah, don't try to hide your awesome idea. I mean, I have this new cat sh picture sharing application which disappeared in five seconds. Just tell it, nobody gonna build it anyway. Only you believe in this idea, most probably. Uh, yeah, focus on product. Don't spend too much time on a, maybe in the first few months blogging and later just build something and the product is called minimum viable product or MVP, just ship it. Mm -hmm. And then you can start doing another activities. And yeah. Having simple, boring tech stack is fine. I mean, your friends are going to ask, well, you have a startup, why don't you use Haskell? To you, I'm going to ship it. So just do something you know, something for fun, but just ship it. So, yeah, that's it. Questions? Okay, this is our, our team at Tech Hub. Really nice place to build your startup. Thank you.
question, what was the items on your first graph? One project, ten project? It's hundreds. It's hundreds. Huh? It's hundreds. So it's 430 projects was the last one, uh, the last <laughs> one that we saw. And it's, um, it's projects per month. So we have roughly around 120 companies on the, or, that are using the, the, the product, including LinkedIn, Rackspace, of course. And, uh, and yeah, we have... And here, the sale guy. Look, <laughs> sale guy. I already bought... Uh, can I bought... Bought... He was a sign-up link. <laughs> can you tell something about your monetization model? Or... Yeah, it's a basically a SaaS model, monthly cost per user. And we have deal sizes starting from $100 per month to a few thousand dollars per month. Few Depends thousand? on the company. A few thousand? Just sign today. <laughs> the average deal is about $10,000 a year. Um, the top end customer is spending $36,000 a year with us. Few thousand, you insult me. Few is You just give two big discounts. Yeah, that's true. That true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now you're doing the sales. <laughs> yeah, it's the same as one thousand, more or less. I guess he just said ten thousand so fancy. I think. What I mean, few in Latvian is different from few in UK. Yeah, right. <laughs> few in London is three thousand, two thousand. Yeah, it's like one point five. What's this many pounds for him? Thank you guys. Thank you.